the three questions you have to answer yes to in order to know it's the right person. It's not in any order, because you have to answer yes to all three. It doesn't matter, it's not a priority order. In my dating workshop, so for those of you who are single, or advising people who are single, these are the three questions you must answer yes to to know it's the right person. For those of us who are married, if you answer no to one of these questions, do not leave the room and turn to your spouse and say, I knew it all along, and Lori just confirmed it, all right? <laughs> Don't do that, they will never invite me back, all right? For those of us who are married, these are the three areas that we have to put a lot of time and effort into in our marriage, got it? Okay, question number one. Do you have the same goals? And I don't mean we both want to get married and move to the suburbs and have a three-car garage and go south once a year and north once a year. I mean meaningful life goals. Not just do we want to have children, what values do we want to give our children? Not just what does our house look like, what does our house feel like? What do we want to contribute to our community, to our people? Somebody came up to me after a dating workshop and she goes, I don't know if the guy I'm dating has the same meaningful life goals as I do, because I don't know what my meaningful life goals are. It starts with you. Until you know who you are and where you're going, you don't know who to go with. My day-to-day -day goals are very different than my husband's. I'm doing a carpool lift scheme, I'm doing a lift scheme, I'm, I'm meeting somebody for coffee, I'm counseling somebody, I'm finishing a chapter for my publisher, I'm doing another lift scheme. My husband's a rabbi, he's being a rabbi all day. He marries people, he buries people, all right? But our day-to-day -day goals together, that we want to contribute something to the Jewish people, we may do it in different ways. This is not just a nice thing for the Jewish people, this is good for our marriage, do you understand? When I was dating to get married, Again, until you know who you are and where you're going, you don't know who to go with. For me, because I'm extremely idealistic, for me, when I first started dating, I was like, doctors, lawyers, accountants, I realized I can't marry one of these guys. For me, for some people, being married to an accountant is the perfect thing for them. But for me, no. If I married an accountant, what would I say to him at the end of the day? So, honey, everything add up? Okay. <laughs> Because of who I am, and because even many years ago, I was driven to do something for the Jewish people, I needed somebody who didn't just say, that's nice, dear. I needed somebody who was, who was with me, who was a partner in this. All right. So number one, do you have the same goals, meaningful life goals? Number two, are you physically attracted to each other? The Talmud said this is a very, 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 very important part of a marriage. And not just for the first years until the kids come and then This is actually supposed to be getting stronger in a marriage and not weaker. In the Torah, when it says that a husband is intimate with his wife, it says, and he knew her. The more knowledge, the more love. The more love, the more desire for each other. But men and women often look upon this area differently. Now, I'm going to generalize right now. What does generalize mean? There are exceptions, all right? But in general, for a woman, Attraction to the man is very much inside out. And for a man, it's the opposite. It's very much outside in, in general, general. Imagine, imagine you're single. Girls, I'm talking to ladies now, okay, girls? You're single, and you're standing at a party with a friend, and you see a guy cross the room, and he's hot. Which is a very regional term, I have to tell you. I speak all over the world. If I say hot in London, they're turning up the air conditioning, okay? <laughs> In London, he's fit. In Costa Rica, he's wapo. In Brazil, he's a cat. I once spoke to a deaf audience, he's this. Okay, okay. <laughs> but you say, I found that you say hot here, right? He's hot, okay. So you look at, and your friend sees you looking at him, and she goes, he's hot, isn't he? And you're like, oh my gosh, he's so hot. And she says, he's my cousin, do you want to meet him? Totally, like, of course I want to meet him. So now you're going across the room with her and you're like, okay, no, I can't do it, I can't do it. Okay, 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 oh, okay, oh, okay, okay, okay. And then you get across the room, your heart's beating out of your chest, you have no saliva in your mouth. She introduces you to the guy and she slips away. Now you're talking to the guy. A few minutes in you realize, porch lights on, nobody's home, okay? <laughs> 
Somebody said, body by Nautilus, brains by Fisher Price, okay? <laughs> for a woman in general, you're not even physically attracted to him anymore. It's different for a guy. He sees a girl across the room, she's hot, there's nothing, he still wants to be with her, all right? <laughs> it's true, it's true. In marriage, it's also the same in marriage. For a woman, how he treats us outside the bedroom is directly related to how we will treat him inside the bedroom. And for a man, it's the opposite. How she treats him inside the bedroom is directly related to how he treats her outside the bedroom. Do you hear the problem? Okay, somebody has to make the first move here. And don't wait for it to be the other person. So for a woman, if he's supportive and understanding and a great father and considered outside the bedroom, that directly relates to how she will treat him inside the bedroom. I'm going to give you an example of how romance can change in a marriage as years go on. There's still romance, but it changes. I'm going to give you an example that you're not going to be able to relate to because you live in South Africa. It's about housekeeping, okay? So just imagine, okay? Imagine a life without maids. I have to tell you, <laughs> Rabbi Chaim Willis, he is the head of Aisha Torah here in Johannesburg. He is my husband's best friend. He brought my husband into Aish. My husband became religious through Rabbi Willis. My, Rabbi Willis made our shidduch. He introduced, I met Rabbi Willis, he introduced me to my husband. He changed our life. We have tremendous gratitude to him. And whenever he asks us to do anything, even if it's flying across the world and speaking nonstop morning, noon, and night, we always say yes except when he asked us to move to South Africa. About 13 years ago, they made a big push that we should move to South Africa. And it was a big, big push. And in the end, we decided it was just way, way, way too far away from our elderly parents. And we said no, and it was hard to say no to Rabbi Willis. But one of their pitches was, Lori, you'll never do laundry again. <laughs> and I was like, that doesn't matter to me. Can I tell you, 13 years later, every time I do laundry, I think I'll never do laundry again. Okay. <laughs> But I'm fine with that. Okay, fine. All right. So I'm one of those people. I don't mind doing laundry. I really don't mind it. I don't like putting it away. I don't mind shopping for groceries. I don't like putting them away. I don't mind loading a dishwasher. I hate unloading dishwashers. It's just the way I am. One night when our children were little, my husband went to bed, my kids are asleep, and I don't like to wake up to a messy kitchen. So I decided, I'm gonna clean up the kitchen. Now I have to unload the dishwasher. And I hate unloading dishwashers. I opened the dishwasher, and it was empty. Now, we didn't have help. My kids are little. Who unloaded the dishwasher without me asking? My husband. I have to tell you, I got this wave of romance from my husband at that moment. I was like, this is sick, an empty dishwasher, okay? Yes. <laughs> I gave this talk in Minnesota, and it was a marriage talk, and we were all in a room, and there were like round tables with wine and candles, and there was probably like 50 couples. And I gave this marriage talk, and I gave this example. And the next morning, I met with the women of the community, and they told me that the night before, when they went home, their husbands ran to the dishwashers, okay? Look, honey, look, 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 okay. Robertson Weinberg came to Toronto many years ago when we were living there. And she met with the Aisha Tor Robertsons, and she was very, very strong about how important it is to keep this part of our marriage strong, and this doesn't just happen, you must put effort into it. And she says, one of the mistakes we make is that when we go out, ladies, how do we, how do we dress when we go out? We dress great, we're up, right? We dress up, you look beautiful, right? You dress up, and then we go home, and what do we do? We dress down. Okay, you put on your sweats, whatever, right? Listen, our husbands are out there all day long interacting with women who went out, and they look marvelous. And then he comes home to us. <laughs> now, it's not like he's gonna walk in and you're in your sweats and he's gonna call up the base and forget, okay? <laughs> but this is chip, 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 chip away at the fragile Ming vase called our marriages. And enough chips will cause a crack, and enough cracks will cause a break. She told us that every night when her husband, Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, of blessed memory, when he would drive up to the driveway, 
She would run to the bathroom, put on fresh lipstick, spray perfume, fix her hair, and go to the door to greet her husband. And night after night, their kids saw. Their father would drive up to the driveway. She would run to the, she would run to the, the mirror, lipstick, perfume, hair, and go to the door to greet their father. One night, she said she was very tired, and she fell asleep on the couch. And her husband drove up in the driveway, and the kids panicked. Tati's home, and mommy's asleep on the couch. She says she woke up, and they were smearing lipstick on her mouth, <laughs> spraying perfume whenever he is. <laughs> it's a funny story, but listen to the message. Their kids saw, night after night, that their mother cared more what their father thought of her than anyone else in the world. The Torah also has a system that is almost a guarantee to keep this strong. It's the system of Taharata Mishpacha, Laws of Family Purity, Mikvah, which is basically an on-again, off-again system in terms of intimacy. I've had more than one friend who was having trouble in the bedroom and went to a therapist who specializes in this. And I was curious, and I asked them, what did the therapist say? And they told me the same thing. They say the first thing if you go to a therapist who specializes in this is they will tell you abstinence. And slowly, 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 they bring you back together. God does this every month. And the Talmud says to a man, keep the laws of mikvah so that your wife will be like a bride to you every month, that you'll have the desire for her every month like you had on the wedding night. This is also proof, and I know Rabbi Kellerman has a much more intellectual and scientific and rational approach to the div divinity of the Torah, but for me, this is proof that God wrote the Torah and man didn't, because man would never write this in, okay? <laughs> See your local rabbi in Rabbitson for more information on this incredible, beautiful, amazing mitzvah. All right, third question. Third question is different for a man than for a woman. For a woman, she comes to me, is this the one? Is this the one? Is the most important decision you'll ever make in this world? Is this the one? So first, first question, goals, yes. Physical attraction, yes. And then without him in the room, I look her in the eye and I ask her, do you respect him? And she answers yes immediately, without hesitating, then this is it. But if I say, do you respect him? And she goes, yeah, I worry. Or if I say, do you respect him? And she says, yes, but she looks away when she answers. I also worry. A woman came to me in Denver, is this the one that was one? Yes, 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 do you respect him? She goes, yes, and she glanced away when she answered. Now, I don't have my doctorate in behavioral science, but if I ask you a question and you look away when you answer, you're lying. So I probed and there was something about him she did not respect. She married him anyway, and then she divorced him. It is a very, 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 very big deal for a man that his wife respects him. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> I have my theories, ego, society, it doesn't matter why, it just is. He can be the CEO of a corporation and people are bowing down to him all day long, but if he comes home and his wife doesn't respect him, it's not good. Ladies, I'm gonna give you Respect 101 now. This is basic, basic, basic respecting your guys. If, if you're not doing this, don't even come to me, I don't wanna talk to you. Basic respecting your guy. 